we will be, I'll be going through the burden of the problem, uh, the importance of clinical evaluation, and then we will be going through some strategies in how to plan the uh, intervention. So uh, these numbers that you could see in this slide is just to tell you that as we are going to perform more surgeries, we're going to perform more revisions. And if we uh, uh, look at this paper published in 2009, and they were looking for why it's, uh, there's an increase in the trend of revision surgery. Uh, part of it is we're doing more, but uh, the other part or the other important part as well that there is advancement in the spine technology that, would last, that pushed us or let us uh, perform revision surgery in a much safer way. Now, um, is it same primary light revision? No. This is national, uh, this national wide study done uh, for close to 11,000 patients, and they address the difference between primary and revision surgery. The incidence of procedure related complication among the revision surgery is, is much higher. The main hospital stay is much higher, and the complication are variable. In some studies, up to 34% of complication, patient experience complication, after long revision surgery. Even if you come to patient clinical outcomes, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the patient with the primary or the revision surgery are more likely to have this outcome as compared to, the, to those with the primary surgery. Is that because uh, uh, it is, um, it's just like a spine surgery that uh, revision is, is very common? No, we know very well that adult spines deformity surgery carry high risk of revision to start with. So starting doing revision uh, adult deformity surgery, we should counsel the patient that there is a good chance that we will revise you. This study was done in Denmark. They looked at 553 patients. 20% of patients did have complication following adult spine surgery, which means that you could tell your patient one in five that I could take you back again for surgery for a revision. Interestingly, implant failure, infection, presence of com comorbidity, and age was factor, but look at the infection rate uh, of the patient those over 65, it's up to 24% of them. So it's very important always to go back to our clinical evaluation and making sure that we're not missing something uh, that we need to treat apart from the, uh, uh, apart from, uh, the bad looking x-rays. The period of improvement after the initial surgery is very important to dig in. Look at this patient, the moment that you see his uh, x-ray, you would say, well, this patient is failing approximately, whether we agree with his lumbar lordosis or no, but definitely the uh, uh, proximal uh, uh, kyphosis is obvious here, but the patient is completely asymptomatic. And to prove to you that this patient is asymptomatic, he failed his, he broke his road distally while the, while the uh, junctional kyphosis does not change. Another two examples for those two patients who are in their 40s, and both of them had surgery for severe kyphosis years ago, and they were doing so well over many years, and then they just recently had uh, developed the uh, pain and the neurologic claudication. Careful, careful uh, assessment of those patients <clears throat> will let you know that those patients are actually having one of them having bad degenerative disc disease at L5S1 and the other one having severe stenosis just by addressing the distal part or the adjacent level, leaving in peace the previous surgery solve all their problem. So again, the, you may or you may not agree with the intervention, where, or you may or you may not agree with how, look, how the X-ray looks like here, but the patient uh, were uh, extremely happy with just addressing his current problem. So let's go through the strategies to plan intervention. Now, if we, if we keep in mind that uh, there are many reasons for the revisions, and if we could group those, could group those uh, revisions into five groups. So we're revising for proximal junctional failure, distal junctional failure, broken road or non-union, loss of correction, malalignment from the initial surgery, and we will be having a group for pediatric deformities. We need always to keep in mind that we are addressing the core, the morbidities, age of the patient, bone quality, the targeted sagittal and coronal uh, alignment, previous surgeries, and what is the patient expectation. 
Let's take an example. Let's start with revision and proximal uh, junctional failure. Um, uh, I'm not going to discuss the, the things that you all know about their, the, the definition and the classification, but if we go to the risk factor, you will see that some of them are not changeable. We can't change the patient age or his bone quality, but we could always pay attention to the upper instrumented vertebra, the type of instrumentation there, not to overcorrect the kyphosis, the global sagittal alignment. So there are things that in our hands to change, and there are things that it's not in our hand to address. And we operate usually in junctional kyphosis when they are very, very symptomatic. Let's start with this patient, 68 years old, operated for degenerative scoliosis. In a month or even in three weeks, she come with junctional failure. And if you look at her screw proximally, it's penetrating the uh, end plate, and she came with severe, severe uh, pain. So how would we address this patient? We take, take her to OR and we revise her. So how did we revise her? What, our, what was our strategy in revising this patient based on what is published in the literature? So let's take one by one. So careful dissection proximally, preserve the interspinous ligament, and do, uh, bet, bet, do the dis dissection between, the, like the Wilsey approach between the muscles. Careful assessment of patient alignment. Do not do overcorrection for the uh, thoracic level. That's very important and recently published a lot in the literature that we should not overcorrect the thoracic level, neither hyperlordosis than the spine. The use of transition road or use uh, or hawk, allowing that soft uh, landing of, of, your, uh, of your road. Avoid completely reduction screws or reduction tools proximal, proximally. I, I, I keep always asking my fellows that the first, the, the most proximal three or three screws, sh the, the rod should land on them without any reduction tools. Contour the most cranial part as you could see in this image, more um, in a kyphotic way to allow uh, a smoother transition. So let's take another example. It's a bit different, 23 years old patient who had the surgery years ago and he, he, comes, he came with that severe neck pain and forward posture of the neck. And if we look carefully to his CT scan, it's a fused junctional failure. So we're having fused and non-fused one. And the way we, we address it, uh, is by osteotomy. There is no way that they could, we could correct a fused uh, or a rigid junctional failure without doing osteotomy. So a simple ACDF from the front, osteotomy from the back, achieve good correction. So in, first patient, in, the, in these two patients, some of them may need osteotomy, others may not need osteotomies. And the type of osteotomies depend on the patient current alignment, your alignment goals, and the rigidity uh, 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 of, the, of the spine. This paper was published by Kipesh, and he discussed the recurrence of proximal junctional failure. Even if you do junctional, uh, if you do surgery for a junctional failure, there is a 31% chance of recurrence, unfortunately. And most importantly that we need to stress on is the large compensating forces after major initial BGA and uh, were, were corrected. So if you overcorrect the spine, you end up having problems. Also, if you have a thoracic kyphosis, a high thoracic kyphosis that you overcorrect, uh, 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 pay attention uh, to it. Uh, there is a, ch a good chance that you will have failure. This is another uh, patient who failed, and we apply the same principle, and she keeps coming for, for, for failure. So failure and failure and failure with, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, adult idiopathic sclerosis is always happen, and every time we should address them with very uh, uh, clear strategy. So let's go now to the distal one. If we go uh, to the distal junctional failure, an narrative review was published discussing the distal junctional failure, and they, they address uh, all of the, all of the, uh, all are supporting that the importance of restoring normal sagittal alignment. The choice of distal fixation point should be in stable sagittal, coronal, and transverse plane. Balance the fusion mass proximal to the screw. Don't ask your screw too much. So if you're having a fusion mass proximal to the, uh, proximal to the distal screw, that means you need to do a good osteotomy for them in order to improve. Providing solid fixation distal to the end of the, of the construct. These are the four, mon, four main points that you need to address when it comes to revising a patient with distal junctional uh, failure. So if you look at this patient uh, and what we have done for him, so basically caudal fusion level 
in the sagittal stable zone. In this patient, it's the pelvis, so where we should be fine. The distal junctional segment should not be degenerative, kyphotic, or having any form of instability. You need to restore fusion mass, and what we did in this patient by doing uh, uh, multiple uh, posterior osteotomies to, uh, to make him a bit loose. Uh, if there is if the fusion end at S1, then you may need to ensure solid caudal foundation, and that's what we did with S2 screws here in this case. And consider measuring interoperative the pelvic incidence to see how we are performing. Restore lordosis at L5 S1. That's also an important rule to make sure, and that's what we did in this case by inserting the cage in the L5 S1. Consider use of good bone graft and brusier posterior ligament complex in case if you're not fusing to the pelvis. So address these eight points when it comes to distal junctional failure uh, 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 as a way to avoid coming back for those patients. Postoperatively, for, for, to avoid uh, having any problem, please instruct your patient to avoid passive flexion, uh, proper erect position, consider the use of brace, avoid lifting heavy objects. Sometimes you're asking them to, to even use a walking frame, especially Parkinson. Uh, patient. Now let's go to the malalignment or laws of correction, which is the third group that we will be discussing uh, the strategy and revision. This, uh, this paper where, uh, I mean like the revision rate uh, for revision PSO is higher. You have to keep in our mind that these three points. So if, if we're doing a PSO to correct malalignment, we should know in advance that the PSO, the, the rate of failure with revision is more than the rate of failure in the primary. The non-union rate even is higher in revision as compared to primary, and the infection rate is higher in revision than the primary. So having these three points in your mind is always helpful for you planning your surgery and counseling your patient and knowing what you, what you and your patient are expecting. So this patient, she's a 50 years old, had previous surgery for neglected digipathic scoliosis. She came with difficulty uh, walking and forward posture, and we address her. If you look at her uh, L5 pedicles here, it's a bit conical in shape, so the only way to address her deformity is by doing pedicle subtraction osteotomy at uh, L5 to restore her sagittal balance. This is another patient who had her surgery years ago for, um, for um, uh, for stopping her kyphosis, that's what she said. And um, if you could see that the, her spine is completely unclosed from the, from, the, from the front, there's no way that you could uh, do anything except uh, vidica subtraction osteotomy in this patient. So we went to L4, moving away from the previous surgery, moving away from the previous scar, and trying to do the correction at a distal level to achieve uh, better, better uh, alignment. <clears throat> this paper published by Kubesh, again, it's uh, talking about the medical subtraction of CRMA and revision versus uh, primary adult spine deformity patient. Is there a difference? Both uh, uh, achieve successful angular collection, but just keep in mind that the primary BSO patient were more likely to achieve better pelvic mismatch, the revision rate after BSO is higher in the revision, the non-union is higher in the revision, the infection is greater with BSO, uh, 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 revision BSO as compared to the primary, but the neurological complication and the implant failure were the same. Uh, again, another case for uh, revision in malalignment. This patient had uh, surgery for his, uh, for his Sherman kyphosis, and um, he presented with pain and forward posture of his neck, and he was not happy with, his, with the way that his spine uh, looks like and the way that he's, uh, he's walking. So again, if we, if we, uh, what, how could we approach uh, a Sherman kyphosis? Uh, we always uh, love to go to stop at T2 in Sherman kyphosis. So if the previous surgery was stopped shorter, then you have to go to uh, more proximal, and T2 is a preferable uh, 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 vertebra to stop in Sherman kyphosis. For the lower instrumented vertebra, when we fuse to the stable sagittal, vertebra rather than uh, the uh, proximal one or the first uh, lordotic vertebra, they achieve better uh, outcome. Consider osteotomies and depend on the uh, severity of the deformity if you would like to do uh, like uh, only posterior osteotomies or major uh, 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 vertical subtraction osteotomy, depend on the, if the 
if the uh, if the disk space in front are fused or open, and if the if the if the how severe is the is the deformity, and we always use a stiff rod and, and avoid a stiff rod and avoid overbending. Few words on the lower instrumented vertebra uh, when we fuse to the. Uh, sagittal uh, or stable sagittal vertebra as compared to the first lordotic vertebra showed uh, lower revision uh, surgery. And the reason behind that, because we rely in our uh, uh, planning the surgery on standing films, and the first lordotic vertebra and the standing film sometimes over because of the overcompensation of the, of, the numbers of, of the number spine, they just mislead you uh, for the right, uh, for the right uh, 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 level to stop at, so going to the stable sagittal vertebra might be the option. In some cases, the stable sagittal vertebra actually is the, is the uh, first lordotic vertebra, and sometimes it's not. So uh, one of the post vector cases, as uh, Anwar just mentioned, uh, these cases, uh, uh, we need to address them a bit different. We, we, we shouldn't only look at the spine, because with prolonged use of the Vipter, you could see how their ribs are fused. So without addressing the fusion rib, you find yourself trying to correct the patient intraoperatively, and the patient simply is not opening up with you. So one of the most important things that you should address when it comes to revising patient who had Vipter is make sure that you are releasing his uh, fusion mass at the, at the rib level, or even if you cannot, just release his ribs from at the costal transverse uh, junction and allow the spine to move freely. So revision for a broken road or non-union. Take this patient as an example. She is uh, 13 years old, neurofibromatosis. She had history of three-column osteotomy, uh, and she presented to the, e to the ER after a fall where she was uh, one out of five uh, 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 power in her, in her lower limb. So the reason for this patient to fail is not only the broken road, is the non-union, and we know that uh, a non-union or fibromatosis patient, uh, the chance of non-union is very high. So our goal with this procedure is not only to add more screws or more instrumentation or to do osteotomy, it's just to add, add, add appropriate, um, uh, like I would say, uh, bone graft that would allow this patient to fuse. And going only from the back with this scarring and devitalized tissue might not be uh, uh, enough. So we went for a uh, mini thoracotomy approach and we put the bone graft and um, uh, uh, fused the patient. Um, this is another patient with a broken road that we went uh, uh, anteriorly and we put uh, two cages to correct her load. So, this, is, this paper was uh, uh, also um, uh, published by Kubesh, discussing, uh, discussing the rod fracture following surgery for adult spine deformity. And um, it's 9%. It's 9% of patient. And 22% of the patient had posterior um, uh, or medical subtraction osteotomy. So interestingly, there is substantial uh, change or range in the rate of uh, uh, road fracture with PSO across center. So we're not using the same technique. Uh, there are some centers that are having higher rate of uh, fracture road as compared uh, to other. Um, the, uh, the broken road was higher among the cobalt chrome road as compared to titanium road or stainless steel road. So that's why most of us actually, when it comes to treating a depa I mean, like adult uh, fragile patient, maybe we are using titanium road rather than um, rather than uh, stiff rod. So junctional failure in pediatric deformity is my fifth group. So it's been uh, uh, discussed a lot in the literature that the uh, common reason for revision in pediatric spinal deformity are pseudoarthrosis, decompensation, progressive kyphosis, crankshaft phenomena, infection, or junctional failure. I'll be showing three cases of, of junctional failure, which is in my understanding, it's one of the, one of the most challenging uh, aspects when it comes to pediatric deformity. This patient uh, uh, had his surgery uh, years ago, and you could see approximately his screws or uh, whatever was used there uh, pulled out, and he's coming with forward uh, posture. So we cut the rod, and we put him on traction. And we try to do a slow correction of his deformity. So we're allowing the deformity to correct without uh, going into an acute correction and allowing, reducing that uh, junctional uh, failure 
uh, gradually while the patient awake until we reach to the stage that we're happy, so we, uh, we fuse him without major uh, osteotomy. Same thing happened to this patient. Again, he had two vipters, and he, as you could see, that both, uh, both ribs uh, broken and the two, the two vipters uh, uh, dislodged, uh, the two rib had dislodged from their place, so uh, we put the patient in traction. We took the ribs out, we put the patient in traction, allowing uh, slow correction, gradual correction of his junctional failure, and we eventually were happy to achieve uh, a reasonable correction without major osteotomy, without uh, uh, the complication of acute correction of junctional failure. Another example of patient, she is uh, 17 years old, case of tetralogy of late, post-multiple open heart surgery, type two respiratory failure. The, the cardi we, we, we took the patient to OR under cardiac anesthesia. No one would like to put her in sleep uh, because of her, her major comorbidity, and they just push us to do the, the surgery uh, in, uh, in, in, a few, uh, in a few hours. And she had her surgery, but she failed very early uh, following the surgery. So we took it again, we took everything out, we put her in traction, and you could see clinically how, the, uh, how her spine improved uh, with, with slow traction over weeks or uh, over a few weeks until we end up fusing her in reasonable uh, uh, pos position provided her uh, pre-existing uh, comorbidity. There are many things, many, many papers in the literature discuss the importance of uh, uh, like halo uh, gravity traction for uh, for uh, for uh, uh, pediatric uh, severe pediatric deformity, and we are we are in the process of publishing uh, the use of halo traction uh, for uh, for junctional failure and pediatric deformity. So the take-home message: these are the five groups. So we're having either broken road and broken road. We need to improve the uh, healing process. So we need to uh, have the primary stability and the stiffness. So we need to, go, to have good point of graph. And we have the proximal junctional failure. Here is the, the approach, here is different. We need to reduce the stiffness, not to increase the stiffness, and make sure that we're preserving muscle attachment, preserving ligament and joint capsule, and careful contour and avoid overcorrection of thoracic kyphosis. In case of loss of correction or malalignment for initial surgery, osteotomy is important. Revisiting, just changing the screw will not change much if you're having uh, if you're having major uh, or uh, symptomatic loss of uh, correction or malalignment. And when it comes to distal, distal junctional failure, we need always, we need to, to consider always extending the fusion to the pelvis, very importantly uh, restoring the sagittal alignment, and as uh, uh, Prof. Kubesh mentioned, the importance of uh, uh, L5S1. Uh, and for the fifth group, which is the junctional failure and pediatric deformities, consider uh, pre-op traction. Thank you so much.